Welcome to Sustainable Packaging with Corey Connors. I'm excited about my guest today. Mr. Connor Bryant is the CEO of the Rubbish Project. How are you, Connor? I'm doing very well, Corey. Thank you very much for having me here. Well, we've been going back and forth trying to schedule this, and I'm really excited to have you on. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you get into sustainable packaging, sustainability, all the all of this? Okay, no, no, no problem at all. So I think probably it wouldn't be fair not to start with, with my mother. My mother was Julia Hales, who co-authored, among another other books, but co-authored the New Green Consumer Guide with John Elkington, who also happens to meet my godfather. So, you know, given that she got involved in the environmental sustainability movement in her kind of 20s, of course, I, you know, by the time, by the time she had me, she was a little older than that. So, you know, I've, I've grown up indoctrinated, <laughs> some might say. Into the, into the world of green. But actually through school and, and university, I, I studied product design and really partly because it was my passion, but then also <laughs> throughout university, I discovered really that, that product design played a major responsibility for the problems that we saw in the world. Essentially the, the wasteful systems that we had were wasteful by design. And so this is really the background of me getting into this industry is that while doing my product design course at university, I became increasingly disillusioned with mainstream product design. As I saw design had really been sort of somewhat hijacked, is that you know, I felt that the design was problem solving and what greater problem is there to solve than the planet's problems. But of course, one other problem you could solve is how do I make a business more money? And of course that <laughs> does seem to be where the focus, understandably, but that has been the focus of, of where my industry has gone for many, many years. And, uh, and of course, the result is evident. We have incredibly wasteful systems of consumption. And so this really respawned me when, when leaving university to set up a sustainable design consultancy, originally called Loop Innovations, now called Rubbish Ideas with my then and current business partner, Jack Schneider, a fellow product designer from Loughborough University. That's a brilliant name. I love it. Rubbish ideas. That's awesome. And I, I appreciate what you said. We need to design packaging for it's commonly thought of or it's end of life or it's next life. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today is the circularity of packaging and how it can be reused and reused and repurposed and over and over again in perpetuity, which is, in my opinion, the best way to do it. So tell us about the Rubbish Project. What is that? Okay, great. So with the Rubbish Project, we're trying to help large companies that have linear supply chains consuming vast amounts of disposable products into a circular, you know, helping them transition to a circular economy model. And, you know, the reason for this is, or the reason for the, the focus of the rubbish project being this, is that this was the scale of, the largest scale of waste problem that we could identify is that when we started with rubbish ideas, we were looking at how we could design out waste and systems that were wasteful. We were working with businesses to redesign their business models. And we noticed actually started with the, the events industry and disposable packaging used in the events industry. We identified that lots of single use disposable packaging was being used yep. in a linear system, but that actually the, the technology existed today to make that system circular. I mean, take, and this is, this is indeed where the rubbish project started, PET drinks cups, plastic disposable cups, lots of festivals, football stadiums, music venues, pubs, etc., conferences, use these disposable plastic drinks cups. Now, traditionally, these were made from virgin PP type of plastic for anyone that's, that's not aware. And that, polypropylene, right. Polypropylene, yeah. exactly. And, you know, made out of, of virgin PP, used for an incredibly short period of time, often thrown on the ground or, or, or whatnot, and then incinerated at best, landfill right. or polluting the environment at worst. Right. And... Of course, with the scale of, of, of international events, you know, I think big sporting events like the Olympics and, and whatnot, you know, the, the scale of consumption of these products was huge. Yep. What was really interesting, though, is that there had been a move to, towards more and more PET products. Mm -hmm. But yet, despite the fact that PET bottles were being collected and recycled, PET cups were not being 
recycled in in any way because they were although it was the same material it was a different density and thermo formed pet is slightly lower quality than blow molded pet so when recyclers had a choice of slightly lower grade or slightly higher grade and there's masses of material to choose from they were just ignoring this perfectly recoverable material in favor of pet bottles right. but we thought this was a missed opportunity to show that actually even disposable packaging can be supplied in a circular economy model. Now, of course, in a circular economy, reuse is best and reusable models are great, but reusable models don't work everywhere. You know, there is no silver bullet solution. You know, imagining that McDonald's could switch to all, you know, reusable glass and ceramic, you know, things is obviously. And so you know, we need different systems for different use case scenarios. And of course, what we're trying to prove is that at vast scale, the businesses, the, the largest companies in the world that are consuming, you know, literally billions of these single use disposable items that actually they can be consumed in a system where they are recaptured and reprocessed back into exactly the same thing. And so that is what we set out to prove. And as I say, we started with, with the events industry, working with festivals and, and you know, music festivals and even football stadiums. And, through that, we have now formed a partnership with Hootamaki, one of the world's largest producers and suppliers of food service packaging. They're much, much larger in the fiber, fiberboard space than the plastic space. So well, although they make billions of, of plastic cups, they make hundreds of billions of paper cups. Of course, all, orders of magnitude is <laughs> bigger there. But our, our partnership, in... sorry, just, just to yeah. finish off the thing. Yeah, yeah, please. But, our partnership with Hutamaki shifted our focus away from just PET cups right. at events because we, we never saw ourselves as the plastic cup guys or the festival guys. We are the circular economy systems people. And so obviously with the partnering with Hutamaki, we thought, right, well, they have packaging that goes out to a, a wide range of packaging, not just PET, wide range of materials. And it goes out to a wide range of clients and markets. So what is our purpose and our purpose has uh, you know less of the has shifted to thinking okay well the challenge is you have to track all of these products so that they can be recovered and that is what we do that's excellent so you're setting up recycling and recovery programs for events and festivals and all of these kinds of places where does the material go does it go back to hudamaki okay good question so in the case of recovering the, the PET, for example, PET drinks uh, cups, we can that material can be turned back into new cups. So that it, it is indeed supplied back to Hootamaki. And of course, that happens for a disparate web of connected by various waste managers <laughs> sent to waste processors that we work with, uh, and, then, and then so on. But yes, essentially, the, the material goes right back, the PET material goes right back to Hootamaki. Now, that isn't possible with all material streams sure. yet so for example with with paperboard products we haven't yet developed a product that hutamaki can make from their paperboard waste so that paperboard we recover we log that it's been recovered we get it recycled but not by the original company producing it but as i said our aim is generally to create systems where the products can be made back into themselves and the reason for this is quite simple really is that therefore supply of material meets demand. Is that if you take coffee cups and you say, oh, well, I've got a recycling solution for coffee cups, I'm gonna make them into napkins or I'm gonna make them into chairs. Well, does the world need as much napkins and chairs as coffee cups they consume? <laughs> right. if, if, if they don't, if they don't, then you're still gonna have more coffee, you know, you're gonna have more coffee cups than, than you need to process. So it, right. having those products match up is really effective. And it also sets the goals for companies of 100% recovery, because in a world where there's 100% recovery, then then is no need for external material sourcing. Well, that's excellent. Well done and kudos to you and your team. Has the UK plastic tax affected your business? Or will it in the future? Yes, it has. It has. I mean, obviously, well, not us, but it affects our clients and therefore it affects how our clients think and act. And right. it's affected them in, in good ways and in, and in bad ways. I, I think that 
one of the big problems that we that we have at the moment is and i think this this actually comes back to one of my my, my sort of original problems it's a very long time the industry has been pushing the problem back on the consumer, blaming consumers for the problems that we see in the world. And the problem is, is that consumers have been taking that responsibility on board and taking it really seriously and trying to fix it. But these problems are complicated. This is, you know, sustainability is not a simple science. There is no one size fits all. It, it, you know, there's lots of nuance depending on systems of use, circumstance. One system that works somewhere will work differently somewhere else. So it's a very complex issue, very true. which of course the general public are not going to get their head around. Frankly, they have bigger fish to fry. They're worrying about making enough money to eat and, and taking their kids to school and so on. So they're not yep. going to become sustainability experts. But that means in a world where responsibility is put on them, but they don't have the answers, they latch on to simple solutions, which is understandable, but can do almost as much harm, if not more harm than good. Plastic in the ocean is terrible. And there are actually lots of other negative effects of, of plastic, such as microplastics and even you know, polluting our environment before it gets to the ocean. But this doesn't necessarily mean, a, in fact, it doesn't mean that plastic is an evil material that we shouldn't use anywhere. And, you know, the problem is, is that that sort of nuance is a difficult conversation to have with the public. But yep. The public are affecting the legislation and the legislation is affecting how business is acting. And so essentially we've got popularism driving decisions. Right. And, you know, that's not a great position to be in. And as I try and warn the companies that we work with, the problem is, is that public opinion is fickle. <laughs> what I mean by that is they will change their mind when presented with greater information. So if you jump on the trend now and you ban all plastic, even where it doesn't make sense, when awareness that actually that wasn't the right thing to do grows, the consumers aren't going to blame themselves for being misinformed. They're going to blame the companies who had all of the right information but chose to just follow the popular opinion. Yeah. And so, you know, it's dangerous just going with, you know, what is publicly perceived to be the right thing to do for businesses yeah. because you, know, you might be hobbling yourself for the future sorry that's a, as you can see it's a bit of a oh uh, that's a great answer yeah thank you yeah and and it's so complicated and it's so diverse and there's so many issues to look at plastic is oftentimes considered evil and i i disagree with that i agree with you it can often have a great place it's very recyclable et hdpe very recyclable materials and easily recovered often and easily turned right back into what they used to be or something very similar you know we have a company here called pack tech they take milk jugs and they turn them into fridge can six pack and four pack holders in perpetuity forever it can be recycled and reused and recycled and reused that's circular and that's what we're trying to do here i think yeah yeah no that's that's brilliant exactly it's the sort of model that we need to move to and, and to be clear you know on on the plastic side of course the majority of, of plastics are petroleum-based plastics so therefore they come from oil fossil fuels yep. you know not sustainable in the long term so you know we're not you know, it's one of those things I'm not saying that, that plastic is the best material in the future, but that yeah. we, you know, we are going to hopefully replace plastics, probably with bioplastics, which will be much like the plastics we have today, but renewably derived. And, you know, we've already seen examples of that and further development is being made in that era to, you know, a startling rate. But of course, the, you know, the worrying thing is with people, consumers at the moment turning off plastics is that they are switching to solutions that are just frankly worse. You know, I mean, switching, you know, a sort of thing about Alaska Airlines switching from recyclable PET water bottles to Tetra Pak, a, you know, virgin mix of, of three different materials that, you know, can only be recycled in very specialist facilities. And they were claiming that as a win. And, you know, it is, yeah, there's a very interesting challenge there. Yeah, I, I had that first thought when I saw that and I saw a big pushback on LinkedIn and the internet, people saying, oh, that's a terrible decision. But I, I interviewed the guys from Tetra Pak, and they are they set up a recycling system for this particular situation. So that to me is very circular, much improved, and a great idea. So as long as they stick to that and they're actually getting those recycled, which it sounds like they are, it's a it's a circular model, and I think it's an improvement. 
So that's good. <laughs> yes. No. So I, on that, I completely. I think it is a very good thing to have products supplied. You know, with the company that's supplying them taking more responsibility for making sure they can yep. be recycled. So that is a positive move. Where I would be slightly hesitant to that is it just that that wasn't the area that needed saving, right? That PET, <laughs> that PET bottle can already be made out of 100% recycled material and can be collected and recycled with existing infrastructure without having to put new infrastructure in place. And I think most importantly, one of the things that, you know, is a barrier for Tetra Pak still to reach is, okay, collect, recover and recycle. But at the moment, the recovery for Tetra Packs is still, you know, down cycling or cycling into other products. There is no 100% recycled Tetra Packs on the market. And of course, that's that's what we do. But of course, you know, it, it is yep. one of those things. There's also there are steps on this journey. We can't, you know, people aren't going to be perfect first time. I, you know, I applaud Tetra Pak for investing, at, at, you know, in their recycling solutions. You know, I think more focus on making your products out of recycled material as well would be a really good area to pay attention to. And that's, I think, their next step. I agree with you. Kudos to them. Their their the next step is a recycled material that they use to make their containers out of it and and that's exciting because yeah. that, course, that's that's where it becomes actually circular yeah. right and of course the real challenge for them there is is the legislation so you know in fairness that's one of the things is that you know we can pillory companies all we want but this has also been governments moving far too slowly you know in europe yeah. you know still pet is basically the only recyclable food contact material you know we're trying to make progress with PP and, you know, the, in America, you're allowed a bit more, you're allowed to do recycled paper contact a bit more than we are. You know, it's, anyway, lots of legislation progress to be made yeah. there. I'd like to quickly go back because I'm, I'm conscious that I could talk about all these other issues. Quite yeah, a lot, sure. but I'd like to talk more about the rubbish project and yeah, uh, I would specifically too. the rubbish tracker and dashboard. If that's what Yes. I mean. Let's talk about those. That's actually the next thing on my list. So let's uh, tell us about that. How does it work? Okay. Brilliant. So it, it works from the fundamental of really taking a step, taking a step back, you know, when, when approaching these sort of large companies is that we know what they want, right? They want 100% circularity. But of course, it's a journey to get there, or we know what we want them to get to as well, I suppose. Right. <laughs> uh, we want them to get to 100% circularity, and we tell them that that's what they want too. And there are lots of good reasons for businesses to do that. It's not just environmental provisions and actually you know adopting a circular model for businesses will make them much more cost effective and sustainable long term economically as a right. as environmentally but of course the, the first question is if you're going to get to there to solve a problem you need to understand it and in the case of consuming products that you need to know where the products are so the first question is not you know how do we recover these the first question is where are they going because right. if you know where they're going, it becomes much easier to recover <laughs> them because it also solves the question of the, you know, one of the big issues with recovering material is and recycling is quantity. You need certain volumes of material to make the economies of scale in order to recover streams. And so especially if those streams are, for example, a bespoke material like a Tetra Pak is that you need quite a lot of Tetra Packs together right. in one place for it to be cost effective to recycle them. Right. So one of the big challenges in the circular economy is identifying where all of our products are and this represents a marked change for the waste management industry because the waste management industry were previously transport companies that dumped into tips and there's no traceability to that they get paid to pick up stuff they want to pick up from you as regularly as possible so they have regular pickups based on the schedule regardless of whether you know that you've actually you know often waste managers are collecting from businesses on a weekly schedule even if the you know the business's bins are only 30 percent full because that supports their business model and you know definitely the business model that they had a business model that they are struggling to transition away from but of course in that business model there is there is no traceability and really they are, they're incentivized to keep it that way it's, it's you know it's more costly for them to segregate the material and to provide these sort of traceable streams. Yeah. Um, but of course, that's in direct contrast to where, you know, where we need to go and where, you know, big businesses are now demanding to go because their consumers are, you know, more aware of this issue. So what we're doing is we're helping Hootamaki and its customers track their products out into the market. 
therefore we're identifying the venues the locations the events football stadium universities schools train stations airports where these products are consumed we are then offering these location access to a event or location or venue dashboard that contains really two things it contains the rubbish tracker which is a sort of data portal that allows them to upload what products they're consuming and information about what's happening to it and we actually have all sorts of smart devices that we can then sell in that allow us to gather that data automatically as well as smart bits of software so it's not a manual reporting process and of course this data feeds back to us but we also feed this data back to the partners that we're working with so if it's Hutamaki products in that venue Hutamaki is knowing what's happened to their products if it's one of their partners you know a soft drink company or a brewery right. we'll be telling them about you know what's happened to their products the other side of the platform that helps the the venues or festivals is is our consultancy we've taken our consultancy and we've digitalized it and so we oh, have wow course and which contain lessons and so on and lots of digital media that guide people through the process of or guide businesses through the process of managing their waste in a circular way and you know this is giving everything from advice to the again we don't start at the end we start at the beginning so one of the things is that businesses always come to us and say tell us what to do with our waste and we say <laughs> no we're gonna Let's tell you what, <laughs> we're gonna tell you what products to consume and it's then we're going to work our way down to your waste because that makes you know if you've only got one type of material consumed on site then your the waste job is, is, is much easier um, so our platform provides the consultancy that guides them through all of that process as well as telling them how to gather data and upload it into our system that's excellent well um, done. and so it, it creates a reporting mechanism for the businesses that we're working with to not only report what they're doing but to continually improve that, chart that improvement and optimize it. And then on a grander scale, that data allows us to optimize the recovery of this material because the more businesses that we, that we work with in a locality, the more we get a view of the total waste landscape and the more that we can then work with a waste manager to go, right, well, actually uh. you can send around a dust cart and you can pick up a single segregated stream of this highly recoverable material in a very efficient transport route because we've got the managed to gather that data. Oh, excellent job. It sounds like you've really filled a, a niche that needed to be filled. Well done. Yes, and thank you. Well, and, and, the, and the other thing is that it's, it's come from looking at how we could make the approach that we had previously more low cost and scalable. So previously we provided, you know, we've been doing this for, quite a few years now, we've been providing the consultancy to the businesses that we work with directly. You know, we were building them their own platforms and management systems and coming in and advising them on how to set up all these systems, what bins to use, how to segregate their waste, how their litter pickers should run, et cetera. But obviously what we've done is we've taken that knowledge and we've turned that into a much more sc scalable, lower cost digital offering. Awesome. Less one-on-one -on -one time, but therefore, a much more affordable product. In fact, we are hoping to develop a freemium model for our service oh, wow. that allows people to take part in the circular economy for free and to start, you know, to start participating and then, you know, gives them low cost options in order to do to further improve their. I'm writing uh, down that word freemium. I've never heard that. That's wonderful. So how yeah. do people, <laughs> like, how do people get a hold of you guys when they were, when they're ready? Okay, how do people get a hold of us? Brilliant yeah. question. Through our website. So the rubbishproject.com is actually currently being redesigned, but by the time anyone sees this, it will be the new uh, upgraded version that will guide you nicely through the, the services that we have from our sort of, you know, more custom uh, offerings to the, to the more standard tracker and dashboard. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Connor. This has been an excellent episode. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. I'd love to have you back on in six months or a, a year and, and just talk about the progress you're making. I'd like to thank Landsberg Aurora for sponsoring this podcast. And thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, thank you, Corey. It was a, it was a pleasure to be here and to talk with you. And yeah, I'd look forward to talking more. And I say, actually, the other thing about contacting me, if anyone else wants to reach out, LinkedIn yeah. is a great place to, to reach me. Connor Bryant on LinkedIn or The Rubbish Project at LinkedIn. Thank you. 
All right. Cheers, Corey. Thank you very much.